Welcome to Over Coffee, Leaders Talking Humanities. And I really do have coffee. I'm Tyrus <laughs> Taylor, Dean of, of the UCI School of Humanities, and I'm so pleased to be joined by Fernando Niebla. Fernando is largely retired, but still active as an investor and as an advisor to technology startup companies. At the beginning of his career, he worked at the Kennedy Space Center from 1965 through the initial moon missions. Then he returned to California, still working for the aerospace industry. 10 years later, he turned entrepreneur and his main business venture was as the founder of Infotech Development Incorporated, an IT services firm involved primarily in Air Force satellites mission control systems. After merging with a public company in 1996, he was president and founder of two other technology companies, International Training Partners, a business and technology consulting firm serving U.S. and Latin American markets, and CompuServe Mexico that brought commercial internet services to Mexico in the mid-1990s. He has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Arizona and a Master of Science from USC. He serves on many nonprofit and corporate boards, including Fortune 500 companies. Additionally, he was a founding member of the Hispanic Education Endowment Fund of Orange County, which provides scholarships to Hispanic Latinx students of Orange County who are pursuing college. That's a very impressive uh, resume, Fernando, and I thank you very much for joining us. I'm happy to be here. You know, I'm, so I wanted I, to, I'm also having coffee. I have coffee with me. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I, I wanted to start with just a little note about our terminology. And I want to acknowledge that um, some of our community leaders have a strong preference for the term Hispanic. Others have an equally strong preference for the more recent term Latinx. And I'll use both terms typically, except when I'm uh, giving a proper name or a federal designation such as Hispanic uh, Serving Institution, which is uh, a label from the, from the federal government. So- uh, I, 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 I've been around for a long time, so I'm used to all the terminology. So we're in, we're in good shape. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, you've been a successful entrepreneur uh, starting multiple businesses and at least one nonprofit I know that entrepreneurs often um, have various kinds of failures on the way before they have uh, successes. And I wonder what kind of advice you would give a young person who's just starting out, who has big ideas and big dreams and big hopes, um, um, and perhaps has, has actually um, endured an early failure in, in those aspirations. How did you know when to keep going and when to change direction, when to take a, um, you know, a sidestep and, and move forward in that way? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I want to put my answer in perspective. You know, I have had uh, situations where I started something that I wasn't able to finish. Other times when I had to change uh, routes, but I don't call those failures. <laughs> I call them learning opportunities. You know, and, uh, you know, the, my training as an engineer is really uh, has been a, a, a good part of uh, what's helped me along the way. I'm a big believer in planning, you know, so I always uh, advise, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, great to have an idea, but until you have a plan, you know, you really can't uh, uh, advance uh, smartly through, through the process. So... I develop plans that, uh, you know, set a timeline, goals and objectives. Uh, and then I revisit those plans from time to time. And I try to be objective, you know, as to whether uh, if I'm not meeting the goals, am I not meeting them because they were overly ambitious, you know, and, and I can continue and, and do it right? Or uh, is it, uh, were most of my assumptions wrong? You know, so had to call it quits. Uh, or, you know, fortunately, I had opportunity, occasions where things went right along. But the main thing is to be objective. You know, and the, the way I do that is that I always share, when I have an important uh, project, I always share my plans uh, with either friends or with uh, uh, official uh, advisors. Uh, and, I, and I always pick people that I know will be uh, 
very frank with me and will help me be objective. You know, and if you have that laid out, then uh, it really, uh, it, you know, it is, you know, when it's time to make a change, you know, when it's time to, uh, to uh, adapt. And, you know, also when to, uh, you know, the idea just won't work out. So, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I am called on occasion to uh, talk with uh, uh, young entrepreneurs. And, and that is my advice, you know, to have a plan that has milestones and has uh, objectives. You know, you're really not ready to get started because you need that as a guide all along the path. So, so that, that's, that, that's my perspective on it, yeah. So planning and continual assessment and also that very difficult thing of being willing to listen to other perspectives when people are telling you that maybe things that, that you don't necessarily want to hear, but that are important for you to hear. Yeah, you need to have uh, people that you talk with that, that, that uh, will be frank with you. So I've been very fortunate in that respect. You know, so. Very good advice. The, I want to come to the current situation, um, the COVID-19 world that we're living in. And COVID-19 has changed so much about our world. And in many ways, you know, we can imagine that it's going to be significantly changed um, having gone through this. You're a leader in the Hispanic Latinx uh, community or communities. And of course, you know how hard these communities have been hit by the pandemic. How has the pandemic affected your community activities and your discussions in the Hispanic community? Well, you know, uh, the, the Hispanic community has been hit, you know, twice, you know, in two respects. One is uh, many, a large percentage of the community is in the, in the uh, essential services, you know, which means that many of them uh, have a lot of exposure to uh, people that have uh, uh, the, the virus. So they, uh, they're constantly having to deal with, uh, you know, bringing the virus home. You know, then uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of people that uh, were, were, were in the services industries that, I, that went out of business or out of work, you know, closed down hospitals and restaurants. Uh, you know, so the, the community has to deal with both of those problems. And, and I know people and, uh, that, that are being affected in both ways. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about my gardener. You know, my gardener, uh, you know, he's very careful. He tells the uh, ingeniero, he goes to the engineer, <laughs> you, you, uh, I can't afford to get sick because members of my family uh, are out of work. You know, so uh, he keeps his social distance. You know, we, we keep a distance from each other. Uh, he wears a mask and he's very careful. You know, then I have a, a, a niece uh, that runs the Job Corps uh, operations here in Orange County. And she has a hundred people that are out distributing, uh, mostly Latinos too, distributing food and about 20 that are involved in, in COVID testing. So there's a high exposure there. She lives with her mom, my aunt, that's 96 years old. So you can imagine that, that that's, it's a strain, you know, to, uh, for her. So you know, that's, that's uh, kind of the, the, uh, the situation. And, uh, you know, there's, just be careful. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's what I hear from everybody. You know, we have to be, extra careful for, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I don't know where to go from there. You know, that's, that's just uh, uh, wow. the, the situation. Well, you know, um, obviously the pandemic situation is, a, is an unprecedented situation, but many of the disparities and problems that have been exacerbated by the pandemic, and that's health disparities, that is occupational disparities, housing disparities, um, you know, are, are standing problems and ones that, you know, we, you have uh, as, a, as a philanthropist and as, a, as an organizer um, helped to address. Um, I know that you've also been in the educational uh, domain, very involved in UCI as a, in a leadership capacity with the campus-wide initiative to help UCI grow 
from being a federally designated Hispanic serving institution to become to becoming what we informally refer to as a Hispanic thriving institution. So in some sense, not simply having the 25% de demographic of Hispanic Latinx students, but really creating an inclusive um, environment for those students to excel and to gain new opportunities. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing with UCI in that capacity and your, your vision and goals for this Hispanic Thriving Initiative at UCI. Yeah, well, let me start that, that uh, it, it was a surprise when friends of mine, uh, uh, trustees with the university, uh, told me uh, that, that it had achieved that, that status. Uh, it wasn't that long ago where the, the problem was getting uh, Latino students to graduate from high school and register at colleges. So it was just a very pleasant surprise uh, to hear that. Then uh, in talking with, with my friends, you know, the, uh, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm very pleased with uh, what I heard uh, and what I've seen the university doing. Uh, you know, I, when, when they talk about a thriving institution, Latino institution, what I hear is that uh, the university understands that just having a lot of students uh, is it, it, not the job. You know, the job is to get them to graduate. So uh, that, that's the kind of the involvement that, uh, that uh, we're trying to develop. You know, I'm, I'm the conversations uh, we've had have been, uh, up to this point, largely informational. You know, the university telling me and a few of uh, other uh, quote unquote Latino leaders uh, as to what the uh, university has achieved and uh, what the programs, uh, what programs they have ongoing always with the emphasis of we want to make sure that these students uh, graduate. So we're, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're, that is the uh, conversation we're having. And we're not there yet. You know, we, we're still trying to figure out how can we help. Uh, one item that comes up is, uh, and, and it has to do with making sure that uh, the student get, goes all the way through, is a mentoring you know, uh, a type of activity. Uh, right now, we're we're looking at uh, well for a mentoring activity in today's world, you need a social media tool, you know. So uh, uh, you know we're we're looking at what that would uh, that would take. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Hispanic Education Endowment Fund. Uh, we have given scholarships to uh, in the there probably are around forty uh, uh, scholars, key scholars at UCI right now. So we're thinking that they will be the core of, of, uh, of, of our efforts. Uh, you know, talk with them, see what they need. Uh, we've heard some sad stories, you know, where we, we help them get in and then you know, that's the first year, you know, whether they do the second year. You know, financial uh, support is always uh, needed, uh, but also uh, encouragement and uh, just somebody to talk with. On that vein, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm very pleased with what uh, I've seen that the university uh, is, is doing, you know, and, and it's attempting to do. So we're working at uh, what else can we do? Uh, and it's just, uh, like I said, I, I and my friends were pleasantly surprised to see that the university had achieved that status. I, and we're, we're doing our best to help, to help uh, them that along. It's, it's very important and at the same time, as you, as you say, we would have to acknowledge we, we still have a lot of work to do in making sure that our, the students that we, we have at UCI are successful, um, that, they, um, you know, that they feel at home at UCI in the community and in our courses and also that um, they have the financial support that they, that they need in order to, to be secure in their in their studies, and I would also say, you know, we want to see more of our Latinx students go on to graduate school to earn PhDs and masters um, and advanced professional degrees, MBAs and law degrees and medical degrees. And we still have a long way to go in terms of really 
addressing that that uh, graduate level of, of education. You know, uh, that, that, that was, uh, and I've been getting a lot of information about the demographics of the school and where the students are registered. And, and uh, I, it was also very, uh, you know, I, I keep reading pleasant <laughs> surprise, but it, I guess uh, uh, it's it just good to see that there are a number of students uh, pursuing uh, graduate de degree programs, you know. So uh, the the, uh, the the road is there. You know, I I, I, I think it's being uh, it's happening. So Fernando is a long term volunteer leader on our campus, uh, particularly in the humanities. What would you say to listeners who are considering investing time or charitable giving at UCI? And I would make a pitch for the humanities as a, as a great place uh, for this to happen. Um, as you know, we're uh, home to the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, to the English department that um, you know, also does work in, in Latinx uh, literatures, Center for Latin American Studies. Um, and we're currently engaged in um, a cluster hire to bring more uh, Latinx expertise into the school. So um, with that as a background, um, I, I wonder if you could advise someone who is interested in getting involved either through their time and effort or through their charitable giving. You know, I, I have been involved with UCI for longer than, <laughs> than I want to tell you. <laughs> and the, initially it was with the engineering department uh, and then uh, in the last 15 years, you know, with the humanities department. Uh, the, so my experience was one of uh, getting involved because I knew people there. You know, I had friends uh, in the engineering department first and then in the humanities department. And through them, uh, I, I became familiar with and uh, sometimes involved with activities. And... Uh, it, all of that was something I enjoyed, you know, so that's the first thing I would tell somebody, you know, if you're involved with the university, you're going to find a place or, or activities that you will enjoy. The, the, the giving uh, just it comes naturally out of that. You know, I had the opportunity from time to time to uh, at one point sponsor uh, uh, a, a project uh, in the engineering department at another time to sponsor a professor that went to Latin America to try to recruit uh, professors, you know, to come and, and teach at the, at the university. Uh, and those were things that were of interest to me, you know, so I, I was, uh, it, it was, it was uh, something that came naturally. In the uh, humanities department, I don't know if you uh, were there when Dr. Menton was there, uh, no, I don't think so. That was, that, was, that was a long time ago, like I said, longer than I care to, to admit. But he was, uh, Dr. Menton and Dr. Barrutia uh, were both there uh, at the university. And uh, I got involved with some of their programs. And, and that, I have to tell you, the, my involvement with humanities had been uh, fun. What <laughs> I've been involved with have been activities that I thoroughly enjoyed. You know, with Dr. Menton and Dr. Barrutia, you know, I attended and had the opportunity to sponsor some uh, uh, segments of conferences that, that they were leading. So I got to listen to uh, excellent lecturers and uh, see professors argue <laughs> very fine points, you know, about uh, Latin America, uh, all in, in, in good fun. So... Uh, uh, my question will really be, how, how do you get people uh, involved in the fun parts of the humanities department so that this, this will uh, happen? Yeah. Well, one thing that I can say is we, you know, we do talk to a lot of people. And as you say, you have to find the thing that really is someone's interest and, and passion and then, and then make that invitation and, and continue to, um, you know, to continue to talk to people and continue to engage them. I would say that the other thing that we're doing um, through the Humanity Center, which we launched actually last year um, with our director, Judy Wu, is a very significant 
um, amount of what we would really think of as more public programming, programming that has greater public interest. You know, some of the conversations of our scholars really are for other scholars and it would be difficult for someone who's not an expert in those fields to step in and, and find that fun or, or even necessarily that meaningful. Uh, but we are also um, hosting a number of events, primarily through our Humanities Center, of things that we know are of public interest. Um, in some cases, it involves journalists. In other cases, it involves scholars. But really, you know, on those kind of big question, questions that matter, topics that we know um, will engage you know, people in the public more. So there's a variety of ways in which we do that, but I think that's, a, that's an important step that we've taken just in recognizing that, um, you know, not all of our things are necessarily for a broad public, but we also have, a, have an obligation really to be talking to the public about things that matter to us and that, that matter to them. Now, I'll, I'll just add that uh, the, the involvement with the humanities department has been uh, uh, my wife and I, you know, she couldn't get involved in the engineering activities, but certainly in the humanities activities that uh, we have been on and off, you know, for the last several years, you know, it's something that we, uh, we both enjoy. So uh, I encourage <laughs> listeners, you know, to, uh, to find a way to, uh, to, to get involved and participate. And the first part can be just fun, but uh, in the long run, I think, uh, uh, you know, they, they'll find things that they'd like to get involved in. We really appreciate your involvement and your participation in the humanities. I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, kind of the bigger context in which you see my works. And, you know, this, we've already raised this question of the public. Uh, Orange County is home to one of the largest Hispanic Latinx populations um, in the country. So what role do you think that UCI should play in advancing Hispanic Latinx community and culture in Southern California? You know, that, that's, that's a, a, a difficult question, but uh, let me take it in, 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 in parts. You know, there's, uh, there's the work that the university does because it is a university, you know, and the university is doing uh, very well in, 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 in that respect. You know, I'll just point to something you told me about, you know, the uh, uh, cluster hiring that, that, you, that, that you're doing, you know, that, that involves cross, uh, uh, you know, work across the several disciplines, cross discipline uh, work. Uh, so, you know, and I know of other activities that are taking place, you know, that, that uh, so, so from that perspective, I, you know, I, I'm not in a position to advise anything more. <laughs> to be done there. The other one is uh, in, in uh, making sure that the doors are open to the students, Latino students. And, uh, you know, the Latino population in Orange County is around 30%. And the enrollment at UCI is 26%. You know, so there's a little bit of, of, of to be done there to, uh, to, to get to the, to, to, to an even distribution, you know, but I think 26% is, is terrific, you know. That's uh, the, the, uh, a good way. So, uh, I'm, 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 I don't know that, uh, that that there's huge amounts of, of additional work to be done there. The the the, uh, the the third component is is community involvement. Mm -hmm. You know that, that you just mentioned, uh, and, and I, I, it's a little bit difficult for UCI, I think, because it is a remote campus. You know, so uh, uh, maybe <laughs> opening a, well, you have a medical center in downtown Santa Ana, you know, so I, I, I think that that is uh, providing a tremendous service. So uh, I, I guess I'm kind of going around the question, you know, that, that I don't know what else UCI could do uh, uh, or what it's doing. And right now with the initiative of the trustees, you know, to get uh, me and a few of my friends involved um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to come up with an answer. You know, we, we don't have it yet. Uh, but uh, all I can say is that uh, the UCI is active in trying to make that happen. So, like I said before, we'll do our best to help 
and uh, and contribute, but don't have an answer yet. Well, I'm I'm really happy for your engagement, and I'm 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 proud of UCI and the School of Humanities also for really helping to step up to this question and and be engaged and work with with you and other community leaders. Uh, I'd like to finish just with a a couple of you know lighter note uh, personal questions. Um, uh, let me ask you: Do you have a favorite? Uh, artist or work of art or you know it doesn't have to be uh, visual art but um, music or theater or <laughs> well you know a guy my age has to say Frank Sinatra right <laughs> <laughs> I... but uh, then uh, of, uh, of course I have my favorite uh, Mexican uh, folk singers you know there's some people some some of the singers are uh, traditional, you know, so I'll just mention a name, you know, <laughs> the, of course, Alfredo Jimenez, you know, he, and he talks about the trails and tribulations. He sings corridos, which are like folk songs, mm -hmm. uh, sang because he's, he's passed away. But, uh, you know, that, that's in terms of, uh, of, uh, of an artist. I, I recently been, uh, I have a good friend, I think I mentioned his name to you, uh, uh, Gregorio Luque. You know, he was uh, the cultural attaché uh, from Mexico in Washington at one time, but now he's, he's local, he's, he's uh, in uh, Southern California. But he's giving a, a series of lectures on uh, the Mexican muralists. So I have become a big fan of the, of the, uh, of, of the uh, art of the muralists uh, that took place in the mid 1900s. You know, so, yeah, we're, we're putting a lot of time into that. You know, every Sunday he gives a lecture at, at, at four o'clock. And this last one, he had over a thousand people from all over the world, really. You know, so we're, we, we're having fun. We, uh, my wife and I are having fun with uh, the Mexican muralists. Yeah, uh, that's a, a, it's an amazing movement and, and set of individual uh, artists, so the re a real... Um contribution and achievement of, of Mexican artists um, in, yeah. that, in that mode. Um, I'd also just like to ask you uh, what you're reading now, or if you have a book recommendation you'd like to, you'd like to make. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Another person I mentioned to you uh, uh, was Father Luevano. Uh, he's uh, at another university here <laughs> in Orange County. Uh, head of the religion the, uh, department, and he and I are uh, r reading uh, Octavio Paz, you know, who was a Nobel laureate from from Mexico, uh, and uh, we're, we're uh, uh, discussing, <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, his motivations and his writing, uh, and and uh, the lessons that he can. That he had, you know, for our, for for our communities. So uh, he, uh, Octavio Paz wrote a, a book uh, called uh, uh, "Labyrinth of Solitude." He wrote it in 1945, and it was uh, kind of a reaction to what he saw in California when he visited here in in 1943. You know, and uh, so that's that's what I'm reading right now. That's uh, and along with that, a lot of other, other books that are relevant to that topic. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, that, that's the main thrust of, of my reading. <laughs> that's a great recommendation for people. Octavio Paz is just a fabulous uh, writer and poet. Yeah. Well, uh, Fernando, I want to thank you again uh, for taking the time to share your story with our viewers. And I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. So I hope that people will join us with coffee cup in hand for our next episode of Over Coffee. Thank you, Fernando. Hey, I enjoyed the, the talk, the conversation. Happy to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.